Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. It's no secret that the smoking of cigarettes causes lung cancer, and it can actually cause some other forms of cancer as well, although lung cancer is going to be the most common uh, for individuals who smoke or who are significantly exposed to secondhand smoke. And there's a lot of different compounds in the cigarette itself that can actually lead to cancer. But what we're going to talk about here is one example, and this is the molecule known as benzo-A-pyrene, or sometimes we'll just call it benzopyrene. So benzopyrene is what we call it's a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Again, the reason it's called that is obviously a hydrocarbon because it contains nothing but carbon and hydrogen. It's aromatic, but there's many connected aromatic rings, so it's polycyclic, okay? And there's also other examples of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that can be found in all sorts of things like cigarettes or even car exhaust, things like that. So when you smoke this, a smoke a cigarette that is, you're going to be inhaling a compound such as this. This is the best example. So this compound is going to end up in your body, but this in and of itself does not cause cancer. Okay? It's actually a metabolic product of it that actually will. Now, what we hopefully know by now is that the liver and also the nasal mucosa, which there's going to be a lot of that cigarette smoke in the nasal mucosa, those areas of the body have a really high concentration of smooth ER in their cells. And we know that the smooth ER has a lot of uh, xenobiotic and drug detoxification enzymes, such as cytochrome P450s right here, and also epoxide hydrolases. And it turns out that those enzymes are going to be responsible ultimately for generating the active form of benzopyrene that's going to be able to mutate DNA and potentially cause cancer. So benzopyrene, when it ends up in an area of drug detoxification, such as the nasal mucosa or the liver, when it gets into the blood, um, ultimately what's going to happen is one of these P450 enzymes, such as CYPE1A1 or CYPE1B1, is going to perform an epoxidation reaction. And it's actually known where this occurs. It actually occurs down here on this carbon-carbon double bond. At least it's a double bond shown right here. And what we get is actually an epoxide formation. Now, epoxides are very unstable. They're very high energy and prone to reacting with things. But this epoxide generally does not react with the DNA. It's actually going to be hydrolyzed by this enzyme, which is a another uh, smooth ER enzyme, another microsomal enzyme, and it's called epoxide hydrolase. What epoxide hydrolase does is it uses water, thus the hydrolase in the name, and it breaks apart this epoxide. So if you notice over here, the product of this reaction, uh, the red oxygen um, actually goes to position 8 right here as a hydroxyl group, and then the water, the, at least the effective hydroxide, uh, gets push, positioned on carbon number 7, and now we have a diol. A diol is just a compound that actually has two hydroxyl groups. Um, generally, they're going to be positioned right next to each other on uh, adjacent carbon atoms. Okay. Now, what happens from here? It gets epoxidated again. Okay, um, this is again catalyzed by the same potential two P450 enzymes up here, CYP1A1 and CYP1B1. Notice this time that the epoxide goes up here on this position between 9 and 10. You see the epoxide form right here. Now, uh, basically because of these hydroxyl groups right here, uh, it makes it less likely that this epoxide will actually react with epoxide hydrolase because epoxide hydrolase is generally much better at targeting hydrophobic molecules. Now, it is true the left side of this molecule is still very hydrophobic, but in the place where the epoxide is, there's two polar hydroxyl groups which ultimately are going to prevent or at least hinder binding to epoxide hydrolase. So this epoxide is just going to stay there and react with something. Now this molecule is small, relatively speaking, so it can actually diffuse through the nuclear membrane into the nucleus. And obviously there's DNA in the nucleus. Here's a guanine residue of our DNA. Okay, it could be any guanine. Um, it just depends on which guanine is exposed. And there's going to be a lot exposed at any given time. The nitrogen shown right here, so where my mouse says that nitrogen is actually going to be a decent nucleophile, and it's actually going to attack this position 10 atop the benzopyrene ring. Okay, so and that's because the epoxide is a very activated uh, type of functional group, so it's going to make this carbon right here very susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So this nitrogen is going to attack this carbon. It's going to free the epoxide, giving you a hydroxyl group right here, but we have a big, big problem now. This nitrogen on the guanine ring is now covalently bound to this benzopyrene uh, type of molecule. 
Okay, it's actually a trial now, but it's very, very bad. Why is that? Because you don't want nucleotides, or really the nitrogenous bases, bound to anything other than the deoxyribose ring. Okay, they don't need to be bound to anything. The only things they need to be bound to are, like I said, the deoxyribose ring, and then also they need to be hydrogen bonding to their uh, partner base on the other strand of the DNA. This binding to benzopyrene greatly disrupts the DNA strand. And so what's going to happen is it's going to be perceived by the cell as DNA damage. And you're going to get a DNA damage response. Now, this is a, at least this portion of the picture I drew from another uh, slide that I used in a separate video. And if you want some more detail on DNA damage, please go watch that video. I'm going to try to remember to include the link to that video on of the description of this video, but it suffices to say that a bunch of proteins such as MRN, ATR, and ATM are going to be recruited to the site of the DNA damage, and the cell is going to attempt to repair it. So it's going to have to do probably a couple of things. It's going to have to remove uh, this nucleotide because it's bound to benzopyrene, um, and then it's going to have to put in another guanine to replace that, and potentially some other bases are also going to be removed as well because it's better safe than sorry according to the cell's point of view. All right. Now, when you have significant DNA damage, so for example, if this is going to happen um, chronically and you're ingesting a lot of benzopyrene and you've got a lot of this adduct right here, you're going to induce a high amount of p53 activation. So p53 becomes activated uh, when you have DNA damage. When you have a high degree of p53 activation, it's ultimately going to trigger apoptosis and you'll have cell death. Okay, um, Because high degrees of p53 activation tell the cell we've got so much DNA damage that we'd rather just commit suicide to prevent mutations from going into future cell lines uh, than risk being alive. So the cell will rather commit suicide than potentially mess up the entire organism or other future cell lines, cell generations, etc. And so you can see high p53 activation triggers the upregulation of genes that promote apoptosis and you ultimately get death of those cells. Now in some cases, the cell may actually not commit suicide. Um, if the p53 activation is low enough, the cell will attempt to repair that region of DNA. But something can happen really bad. The cell's going to repair the DNA, and the cell will, instead of choosing suicide, it will live. But in the repair process, it accidentally adds a base that wasn't supposed to be there. So let's just say, for example, this guanine formed the adduct and that guanine was removed. Well, what if instead of a guanine, it added back an adenine? Now you have a mutation introduced into the DNA. The cell did not die, so now that mutation is going to be propagated into the future generations of cells that are dividing from that cell. Okay? And so you now have a permanent mutation because the repair process of the DNA substituted in the wrong base when this one was removed. Okay? Now, in some cases that may not do anything, but if you're exposed to a lot of benzopyrene or other similar compounds that would induce cancer, um, then you're going to get cancer. And the reason is, is because there's a high probability that some regulatory gene, such as a gene involved in promoting cell death or a gene uh, involved in promoting uh, cell survival, one of those kind of genes and many others, those can be mutated. And let's suppose you have a case where a gene that normally promotes apoptosis is mutated in this process. Well, if the gene that promotes apoptosis mutates and becomes... Uh, it has a loss of function, let's say, then in all the future cell lines, that cell will not be able to commit suicide, commit apoptosis, if it becomes mutated. And so that cell can eventually grow and grow and grow, and you'll have more and more cancerous cells, and that ultimately promotes tumor formation. And so this is one example of how lung cancer is promoted by smoking because when you smoke, you're actually inhaling, I said ingesting earlier, but really it's inhalation of compounds either exactly like this or very, very similar. In some cases, you can actually have many more benzene rings that are um, conjugated to these and you'll have larger polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and that's very bad. You don't want your DNA to be mutated, but if you are exposed to a lot of compounds like this, then it's pretty much up to probability at that point, and probability says you'll get mutations and potentially lung cancer, which is extremely difficult to treat and in most cases fatal. 
So hopefully this video made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.